Hello, I'm Julian Sands. Thank you for allowing me to share my enthusiasm for the poets Keats and Shelley. Of course, I would much rather be with you in person at New Haven, enjoying the magnificent permanent collection at the Yale Centre for British Art, always inspiring, as too are the temporary exhibitions I've seen there. Uh, I've made many personal discoveries, and mostly I've enjoyed in the past the interaction with the warm and intelligent audiences, and I look forward to coming again with other presentations in the future. But for now, thank you to the Yale Centre for British Art for making this recording possible. John Keats, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Although today embraced as poetry immortals, in their time their work was derided and discarded. Keats had dropped out of his medical studies to live amongst fellow writers, artists, musicians in the small village of Hampstead in north of London, a little Bohemia. After receiving critical scorn, his confidence was much boosted by the encouragement of Shelley, a well-educated aristocrat known for his radical anti-establishment views, which he freely expressed in pamphlets. Shelley, too, was also a poet. Keats and Shelley both embraced the natural world, a big nature, the essential life force that enhanced mankind. They both feared the emerging scourge of the Industrial Revolution that required workers to leave rural livelihoods for the mills and factories of the growing industrial cities. We will hear now just a few of the works of John Keats. Happy is England. Happy is England. I could be content to see no other verdure than its own to feel no other breezes than are blown through its tall woods with high romances blent. Yet do I sometimes feel a languishment for skies Italian, and an inward groan to sit upon an alp as on a throne, and half forget what world or worldling meant. Happy is England, sweet her artless daughters, enough their simple loveliness for me. Enough their whitest arms in silence clinging, yet do I often warmly burn to see beauties of a deeper glance, and hear their singing, and float with them about the summer waters. Keats was very much quarantined by his illness, tuberculosis. He couldn't travel. Uh, in better health, he had been to Scotland and the Lake District. But his ideas of, of the world were informed by visits to exhibitions in London, especially the British Museum, uh, and from the, what he read and what he heard from his friends who had travelled further afield. But he had this yearning uh, for the wanderlust of the imagination, which he revisits somewhat in this next poem. Uh, being a keen classicist, he often went to the British Museum to look at marbles and statuary, terracottas, brought there from those who'd returned from the Grand Tour. He was also keen on the translations of the classics, in particular Chapman's Homer. And this is on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told, that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent on a peak in Darien. I talked about his, um, his concerns for the industrial, industrial revolution 
this was a poem addressed to his friend, the artist Benjamin Robert Hayden. Great spirits now on earth are sojourning, he of the cloud, the cataract, the lake, who on Helvellyn's summit, wide awake, catches his freshness from archangel's wing, he of the rose, the violet, the spring, and other spirits there are standing apart upon the forehead of the age to come. These, these will give the world another heart and other pulses. Hear ye not the hum of mighty workings? Listen a while, ye nations, and be dumb. <clears throat> this next uh, uh, poem we will hear, to me, um, is the the most fundamental expression of Keats' uh, beliefs uh, in, in the, the, the need for following uh, a, a life informed by what I've called big nature. It's about quiet, stillness, breathing, about existence. I mean, actually, he sounds like a, a yoga guru who was familiar with the um, Vedic writings from 6,000 years ago. Um, it's uh, an extraordinary um, manifesto for what we might call today the slow movement. It's uh, a few lines extracted from Endymion, uh, a poetic romance. Uh, it's a long poem and, and throughout uh, this little exchange, I will have to um, edit and reduce much uh, of his work, but you can discover it all in any anthology. The anthology uh, I'm choosing to read from is published by the Keats Shelley House Museum in Rome, edited by Duncan Wu, professor of poetry at Georgetown, and I had the privilege of writing the preface. Endemion. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing, an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from heaven's brink. Keats uh, wrote uh, many ballads which inspired the pre raphaelite brotherhood of painters, Millet, Holman Hunt, Waterhouse. And uh, one of those ballads was the La Belle Dame Sans Merci. If you can picture um, some uh, rural setting, uh, a village worker, I always think of this person as being uh, a young woman going out to bring in the cows and coming across uh, a lone, uh, bereft nobleman sitting confused uh, on the hillside. La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me, and she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long, for sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. She found me roots and relish sweet, and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La Belle Dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. 
I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I awoke, and found me here, on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sidge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Keats, <clears throat> of course, having had some apothecary training, was familiar with the effects of opiates and laudanum, which were very freely available in Regency London. Uh, I think that poem and the next we hear uh, lend something to the opening of his imagination through um, their the bit of self-medication. This uh, is called Ode to a Nightingale. It was written in the garden of his home in Hampstead, which today is a, a museum. It's called the Keats House, so you can visit it. And although in the house there's much memorabilia, you don't feel his presence in the way you feel it in the Keats Shelley House Museum in Rome, in the Piazza Spagna. There it feels as if he never left. Here there is a, um, a, a, a wonderful garden, and it's in the garden he often spent time uh, being inspired by uh, the proximity to nature. And he would sit under a newly planted mulberry tree. And today you can still visit that tree and hug it. It's 200 years old and oozes a sort of atmosphere, which, uh, and there's no doubt why, uh, it was his muse. Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed, and Leithwood had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my sole self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is fain to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Uh, another ode, uh, inspired by the British Museum again, is to, uh, to a Grecian urn, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Much speculated where this urn might be today, and there are those who believe it was the Buckingham vase, brought back from Rome by the Duke of Buckingham, exhibited temporarily before being removed to his stately home, Stowe, from where it was purchased by William Randolph Hearst and taken to his Xanadu, San Simeon, in California, and uh, today it's held by the Los Angeles County Museum. It's very fragile now, so not on permanent display, but I have seen it, and you, you understand its scale and monumental power, and understand why it inspired Keats uh, to write this next poem. Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? O oh, attic shape! Fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity. Cold, pastoral, 
When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. I've talked about the garden uh, at Keats House in the Hampstead. Uh, Keats often spent time on a daybed looking through what would be called the picture window, particularly uh, when he was feeling uh, frail. And that's where he first saw Fanny Braun glide across his vision and he, he swooned. Um, the, the landlord had divided the, the house into two, so Mrs. Braun and Fanny had moved in next door, and once he'd seen her, he would listen to the partition wall, newly built, to hear her skirts swish across the floor, which doesn't say much for the building codes of the time, but it allowed uh, Keats to begin his courting, and he courted her uh, with this uh, next poem, Bright Star, it's thought by some that he wrote it for her, but uh, um, uh, research has revealed that he actually um, uh, sent this poem to a few other girls before with some success. So um, it's not exclusively um, Fanny's, but it's, uh, it's Bright Star. Bright Star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round the earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. Mrs. Braun was a progressive woman and said, look, Keats, uh, I think you and Fanny can call yourselves an engaged couple, so come and live with us, our side of the partition. But you can't be married until you can prove to me you have recovered your health and can support Fanny. And, and that is really what motivated Keats to go to Italy uh, on his fightful, final fateful voyage. Um, unfortunately, I think soon after arriving, he, he realized he was doomed and plunged into great despair. He um, received many letters from Fanny. All of them went unread. Uh, it said he wrote her many letters. All of them went unsent. And it, shortly before his death, he told his friend Joseph Seven, who was taking care of him, that on his grave it was to only read, Here lies one whose name was writ in water. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. And that's what it said in the uh, um, Protestant cemetery in Rome for um, a good half century before it was corrected and his name was added. Before moving on to Shelley, uh, I have to give a shout out to the other member of the romantic triumvirate, Byron. Byron was a friend of Shelley's. Um, also uh, a traveller, uh, they spent time in Switzerland at the Villa Diodati on the shores of Lake Geneva, famously telling each other ghost stories, which resulted in Mary Shelley's writing Frankenstein. They also spent time together in Venice before Byron went to Greece and, and Shelley further south to Naples. We'll hear one poem by uh, Byron, who in his lifetime was a huge commercial success. He was, he, his poetry was uh, much read and uh, he, he was a much um, celebrated figure, uh, unlike Keats and Shelley. She walks in beauty. 
She walks in beauty, like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspects and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. It was also from a publication uh, of uh, an anthology of Byron um, found at the Keatshelly House uh, in Rome, uh, for which I also wrote the preface. I'll tell you what I said about Shelley in, in my preface. Um, I had visited uh, Rome in the late 1970s and had just come from the um, Protestant cemetery, uh, visit their graves. And there too, I communed at the grave of Shelley, the great Pied Piper of my teenage 70s punk, anti-establishment, free-loving, free-spirited drama student self. So, uh, I'll tell you what the critics said about Shelley in his, uh, in his day. Degraded and perverted, truly contemptible, hideous and unnatural, he writes phantasms of wickedness. Well, you can see the appeal. Um, but the first poem we'll hear by Shelley that doesn't explore um, those themes at all. Um, it, it's, again, his manifesto. Uh, uh, these lines were written in the Valley of Chamonix while looking up at the great mountain Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc yet gleams on high. The power is there the still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds, and much of life and death. In the calm darkness of the moonless nights, winds contend silently there, and heat the snow with breath rapid and strong, but silently. The secret strength of things which governs thought inhabits thee. And what were thou? and earth and stars and sea, if to the human mind's imaginings, silence and solitude were vacancy. Shelley uh, wrote uh, this next poem after visiting the British Museum to see an exhibition of Egyptian sculpture, an exhibition which Keats too might have seen. It's called Ozymandias. I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Shelley um, preferred being in Naples because he could sail. He was a very keen sailor. And, of course, uh, his, his death uh, by drowning came from um, a sailing accident in the Gulf of Spezia. These uh, lines written in dejection uh, are almost a prescient forth. Uh, um, foretelling of his own death four years after they were written. I played Shelley in a film uh, by Ken Russell called Gothic. It was done in the 1980s and I remember the scene we shot of his drowning. It was the most um, um, uh, affecting and profound experience so uh, I revisit it with these lines. 
The sun is warm, the sky is clear, the waves are dancing fast and bright. Blue isles and snowy mountains wear the purple noon's transparent might. The breath of the moist air is light. Yet now despair itself is mild, even as the winds and waters are. I could lie down like a tired child and weep away the life of care which I have borne and yet must bear, till death, like sleep, might steal on me, and I might feel in the warm air my cheek grow cold and hear the sea breathe o'er my dying brain its last monotony. Shelley was also in Naples when he first heard reports of the massacre uh, at Peterloo uh, in the north of England. Um, this was an event where a drunken troop of um, militia uh, ploughed into a, a group of protesting, peacefully protesting labourers looking to improve their working conditions. And they rode in with their uh, sabres, muskets firing. Many were killed, many more were injured. Uh, the Mask of Anarchy. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of Posey. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castle Ray. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight. For one by one, and two by two, he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. And the little children, who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out of them. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become, like oppression's thunder doom, ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, 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 Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to the earth like dew, which in sleep have fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. That poem was the favourite poem of both Mahatma Gandhi and Karl Marx. Also, while in Naples, he wrote a poem about George III. It makes the Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen, seem like a nursery rhyme. It's called England in 1819. An old, mad, blind, despised and dying king. Princes, the dregs of their dull race, who flow through public scorn, mud from a muddy spring. Rulers who neither see, nor feel, nor know, but leech-like to their fainting country cling, till they drop, blind in blood without a blow. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled field, an army which liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield. Religion, Christless, godless, a book sealed, a senate, Time's worst statute unrepealed are graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. I think it's safe to say that Shelley would not be on a Sunday evening watching The Crown. Um, there are those who um, believed he was uh, uh, the target for assassination by government uh, agents. You know, the French Revolution was very fresh in the uh, sensitivities of the British uh, uh, rulers, the monarchy, parliament, the militia. And he was seen as a, a seditious figure who should be brought in to the Tower of London and tried for treason, a capital offence. While I was at school, I remember well being asked to do a homework uh, assignment to compare and contrast Keats' Ode to a Nightingale with uh, Shelley's Ode to a Skylark. Well, 
after viewing this uh, recording, uh, you can pursue the same assignment to a skylark. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher, from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know, such harmonious madness from my lips would flow, the world should listen then, as I am listening now. When Shelley heard the news of Keats' death in Rome, he was in Tuscany. He was plunged into inconsolable grief, but he also felt this tremendous anger at those who had not recognized Keats' genius, and he was determined to uh, celebrate Keats in, in, in a poem of tribute, and he wrote Adonais, an elegy on the death of John Keats. He refers to Keats as Adonais, as an homage to Keats's uh, enthusiasm for the classical world. But this poem, which some regard as Shelley's great masterpiece, doesn't just eulogize John Keats. It eulogizes Shelley himself, because within a few months of writing it, he too would be um, dead, uh, having drowned in the Gulf of Spezia, and he too would be interned in the Protestant cemetery in Rome, not very far from Keats. It's uh, 55 verses, but I've selected four. Um, Adonais an elegy on the death of John Keats. Peace, peace, he is not dead, he doth not sleep, he hath awakened from the dream of life. Tis we who are lost in stormy visions, keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife, and in mad trance strike with our spirit's knife invulnerable nothings. We decay like corpses in a charnel, Fear and grief convulses and consumers day by day, and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. Go thou to Rome, at once the paradise, the grave, the city and the wilderness, and where its wrecks like shattered mountains rise, and flowering weeds and fragrant copses dress the bones of desolation's nakedness, pass till the spirit of the spot shall lead thy footsteps to a slope of green access, where, like an infant's smile over the dead, a light of laughing flowers along the grass is spread, that light whose smile kindles the universe, that beauty in which all things work and move. That benediction, which the eclipsing curse of birth can quench not. That sustaining love, which through the web of being blindly wove by man and beast and earth and air and sea, burns bright, consuming the last clouds of cold mortality. The breath, whose might I have invoked in song, descends on me, my spirit's bark is driven far from the shore, far from the trembling throng, whose sails were never to the tempest given. The massy earth and sphered skies are riven. I am borne darkly, fearfully afar, whilst burning through the inmost veil of heaven, the soul of Adonais, like a star, beckons from the abode where the eternal are. Thank you for listening. It's been a great pleasure to read for you and uh, stay well.